Hey guys, how's it going? Today we are starting a very exciting project out here in the cut flower garden. Standing in the entrance of the flower garden here, just so you can see layout, we've got four separate quadrants, kind of. Like dahlias are in that quadrant. We do annual flowers here. I'm going to dedicate this back quadrant to perennials eventually. And then this last year was where we had the maze garden, but you can see that it looks very different today. We took the infrastructure of the maze garden out so that we could plant a rose garden. So this space will have 87 roses in the end, 33 of which we are going to be planting today. I brought my sketch out so you could see what we were thinking. Every one of these spaces represents two foot. So we've got 60 feet long on the side, 40 feet. And then it comes in 13 feet right here because in the center of the cut flower garden, we're gonna have a circle grass area. There'll be a bench right in here with a possible little tree. Uh, but we figured five foot spacing between the roses or between the rows and between the roses. And this is how I was best able to fit the most amount in. So that's 87 total. They will be organized sort of into color categories. So the first rows will be our pinks, will kind of graduate into apricot peachy colors, that will graduate into yellows, that will go into creams and then into whites, and then we'll do purples and reds in the last row. And here's what's going in the ground today. I will go over all the individual varieties when we're all done with our planting today, but heirloom roses sent out a bunch of them. Isn't that awesome? We've got this group of them, uh, and then we've got another bunch coming in May. And then I picked up a few down at the garden center as well. We've got a few David Austins here, and then a few other types. This is really pretty, look at that one. Brick house. So this video is not sponsored by Heirloom Roses, but they were kind enough to send those out. We'll link their website down below and you'll be able to see these as we take them out, see what they look like, and you'll be able to see how they grow for us. I've never experienced their uh, plants before, so it's really exciting and I'm excited to get a hold of the next group of them next month. So we will link their website down below if you want to learn more. Also, I know some of you guys might be thinking, oh, you're taking out the maze garden, that's where the kids play. It's actually not <laughs> where the kids play. They did play in it, but there are so many areas to play in uh, that this wasn't like super high on their priority list. I think it's because it was just a little bit of a distance away from the house. I mean, they'd play in it if I was out here, um, but they there's shadier areas up closer to the house where all, all their toys are and they like being in the greenhouse and in the barn. Uh, so anyway, I didn't feel too bad about taking it out just based on how much they used it. Also, I like to change things up a little bit, which this isn't going to change once it's a rose garden. And I've always resisted, I think, the idea of a rose garden because I always thought Thought of it in terms of being incorporated into my flower beds and roses you know if you don't if you don't get right on the dead heading to me they can look a little bit messy you know the dropping petals on the ground or they just don't look as tidy of a plant up top but when they're in an actual setting in an actual cut flower garden setting i'm really excited about it because out here it's a little bit more free you know nothing's perfect out here I don't deadhead things out here ever. It's just more of the flavor of this space. So I think they're gonna fit in beautifully. And I know Aaron's excited about it because he's always kind of been partial to, to a rose garden. So we had fun looking through the catalog and picking some of these out. In fact, he's gonna come out here I think he wanted to aug all the holes today and then we're gonna mulch over that landscape fabric. That's the other thing I wanna talk about quick. Landscape fabric, we typically don't use like kind of as a rule. We don't use it in any of our flower beds except for along our uh, hedge of arborvitaes because we had a huge bindweed problem in one area. Also underneath part of the boxwood hedge in Versailles. We did the same thing because bindweed was such a problem and we don't really want to spray it and we really can't. You know, once that plant goes up in the boxwood, they're both broadleaf plants. If we were to spray the bindweed, it would kill the boxwood. So you're kind of at a impasse. You either have to keep pulling it or you smother it out, which we have done. Uh, so in areas like walkways in our raised bed garden, we have um, landscape fabric underneath the gravel and it's been a like a, I don't know, it's been an amazing thing to have in there because we don't have to spray. I would rather suppress the weeds in areas you're not planning on planting in ever, rather than have to spray them multiple times every single season. So that was our thought process out here. All right guys, so we're gonna start pulling these out, but I did wanna show you a couple of these heirloom roses, which uh, they're 18 months old, right? These roses? I think that's what they said. And they are offering a coupon code. So if you go to their website and do garden20, that's the code, you get 20% off. So there you go. I think they look pretty darn good and I'm really happy they're in gallon sized cans. <laughs> Isn't yeah. that nice? Easy for planting. Yeah. Uh, the ones right here that were potted up down at the garden center, they're probably not heavily rooted. So most of this planting uh, compost will f fall right off their root system, uh, but we'll probably dig a little bit digger, bigger, digger holes, <laughs> bigger holes. But look at this, there needs to be a little QC here. Look how big this Wesley rose yeah. is compared to the Windermere. 
Yeah. What That's in the like world? A That's a year or two difference. Yeah. This is pretty though. Oh, anyway, so we're gonna get these out, lay them out in their rows. Aaron's gonna auger the holes. I'm gonna plant them with biotone. We're gonna come along with land and sea compost and top dress the entire row of roses. And then we're gonna bring the mulch in and mulch the walkways. When we're all done, I think I'm gonna just sit down somewhere, maybe in the Hartley, and I'll run through the list of all the varieties we planted today and we'll toss a picture up so you can see that. Here we go. Good. Okay, Erin has got the first hole dug, and as I was looking at this area with the roses set out, I kind of realized that this is probably the opposite way that most people do it. I'm guessing the way most people would set up a garden space like this is that you would put the landscape fabric in the row with the plant. So you would cut holes, plant the plant, and then you would mow the pathways in areas, especially that get more rainfall. But it just works a little bit differently here. And like I mentioned earlier, we just, as a rule, don't use landscape fabric much because I do feel like it ruins the soil structure. But but in applications like this, I don't want to mess with the soil right around the roses. We want to be able to uh, amend the soil, like the planting row, put compost in and goodies, and not have a barrier between those goodies and the root system of the, of the plant. And that's why we're leaving the planting row open, because by putting the landscape fabric in the walking rows, we are going to be suppressing more than half of the weeds in this area, so we won't have to spray them or spend the time pulling them. So we just reduce the amount of workload so we can hand pull and not have to use any spray around the roses. So I just kind of wanted to re-explain that a little bit. I don't think I was very clear earlier. Okay, so I'm gonna plant this first row so you can see how I do it and then we're gonna take off with the rest of them. We've got the Biotone starter fertilizer right here. Got a nice size hole, Erin, good job. Does this rose have a lot of thorns? Some of these are like real thorny. I should probably get some gloves. Okay, so I'm gonna pour in a little bit of the starter fertilizer. Let that settle. This is an eglant eglantine, eglantine. Why do people name things weird weird names? I can't pronounce. Well, it's probably some town in England. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Maybe they don't like Ontario. Well, probably not. See, these aren't going to be super heavily rooted. So most of this, yeah. <laughs> Look at that. So this rose, these were recently potted. You can see fresh roots coming off of them, but this hole is plenty deep. So we are going to be planting this right up to about, well, they had it planted right here at the roots. I'm gonna probably plant it up a little bit dif uh, deeper so that the this part of the stem is underneath and we have a nice sturdy rose right at the base. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use some of this in here. Nice fresh planting compost. Here's our soil surface. I'm gonna spread these roots out a little bit. With these bare root sorts of things, I like to put a little water in the hole to so uh, settle the soil. Okay, just gonna fill it up just a little bit, let that settle in. Do I need to keep using the nine inch auger or can I go down to the smaller one? I like the nine inch because it, some of these will have a more broad root system and uh, rose roots, once they've kind of hardened up, they're unforgiving. You don't really want to like pinch them in. You kind of want them to spread out, almost kind of like how the top of the vase, you know, of the rose, rose does this. You kind of want the roots to do the same thing. In fact, a lot of people will tell you to dig a much bigger hole than this, mound up the soil in the bottom so that you can spread the roots over that mound. But I'm essentially doing that. I kind of put soil in there and kind of tuck it up under the roots. Does that make sense? This is awesome, all this good compost in there. Not draining very well. Well, it's, I can see it's draining. That's a good uh, look at what we have to expect though, in terms of watering things out here. Okay, that's good enough. We're gonna load more compost in here. Let's see, our landscape fabric is about here, so I'm gonna tuck it over a little bit. Oh, we lost our little, I'm gonna make nice tags for all of these later. I realize that it's making it hard to see, so I'll just put it on here in a minute. Okay. 
Okay, so see that? See how it's buried up to that area where it kind of forks? That way we've got a little bit more stability there. And then you just want to keep an eye on, on them for the next couple of days, uh, the next couple of times you water them, because oftentimes you'll have some soil settlage and you'll need to fill it back in so you don't have any air pockets at all. Okay, that times 33. Here we go. it's the next day we got all of those roses planted plus the whole area mulched so Paul and Bethany came out and they were mulching the walkways while Aaron and I mulched uh, with land and sea compost the planting areas and we were working right up to the end of the day and it was a weird weather day like the sun would be out and then it would hail and then the sun would come out and then it would rain hard for a while and then the sun would come out and then it would rain again it was just so so strange but it's looking so great look at this area completely different it's making me so excited. So you can see that the first row, of course, I forgot that we had pots out here and they have to sit on the inside of each one of the quadrants up here. Same on that side because our grass line runs right on the side of it and then right on the front of it. And I still do want to have two containers indicating the front of this garden. I really like the look. So instead of nine pink roses in the first row, we have eight. And then this row is designated for pinks as well. There are two at the very end, and then we will just work on filling more of these up. We're actually expecting more roses from Heirloom Roses. Uh, they're just gonna be shipping those out as they are ready. I don't know if I already mentioned that, but we have five more pinks coming from them. Next two rows are dedicated to apricots, which can kind of skew pink or they can skew yellow. So I only have, well, how many did I have in here? Four, which is surprising to me. There are more on their way, but one, two, three, four, yeah. Quite a few yellows in here. They took up almost their whole row. I think we ended up with nine right there, so we have room for three more at the end. And then this row is designated also for yellows, but skewing into the cream, uh, which then can go into whites, which there are four whites right in here. And then this row will be mainly, this end is purple, and then that end will be red. I think I represented pretty much every color category. I mean, any rose you pick out, you could probably find a spot for it within the category. And what we plan on doing, I mean, I just picked out ones that I thought were pretty. Some of them I do have experience with, some of them I don't. And what we'll do is just monitor their progress, how productive they are. If they don't produce a ton of blooms or if they just aren't keeping up to, with the vigor of other things out here, we'll probably be pulling some of them out and replacing them with new ones to try. It'll be a really fun spot. I did designate the least amount of space to purples and reds because I, I do like those colors out here, but I don't tend to gravitate towards those, I guess, for flower arranging in roses anyway. So Erin actually ran the water and this is what happens. If you don't do like a super thick layer, which I thought I was, um, when that water turns on, you know, the pipes kind of, or the tubes shake and they'll shake some of the mulch off. 
Uh, but we figured, you know, having this two foot kind of swath of space that's open, we can, you know, heavily amend this area. We can get right to the root system with fertilizer. And then this stuff here, you know, you might wonder if this will produce weeds, like if weeds will root. And this is a chunkier material right here. And this side, we didn't put any landscape fabric. It's just on the interior rows. Um, eventually, this will start to break down. We'll put more on it every year, you know, to refresh it. Uh, but we will not have nearly the weed pressure that we would if we just left it open. And I do think we are going to come along and we're gonna line this whole thing, all the grass edges with brick. So there'll be mulch and then a nice brick border and then the grass. I don't know if that's gonna happen this year, but we just decided yesterday when we got this done that we don't really foresee any reason that we would need to get a tractor to any into any one of these quadrants in the flower garden, especially now that this one's kind of permanent with roses. The perennial side is kind of permanent and then the dahlia area, if we can get them to overwinter in that space, then hopefully we can just kind of keep that one permanent. And the only one that will be shifting a whole lot will be this one. Um, and that will be dedicated more toward those annual flowers that I start from seed every year. And I will be starting far less of them. So dahlia area, which I might shrink a little bit. You know, I might find that I want less dahlia so I have more room for our annual type stuff that will be going in that section there. Um, I did plant three rhubarbs up here. There are a few like random things. So the three rhubarbs will stay. And those are looking pretty good. The crimson cherry variety. Yeah, putting on a little bit of growth. And in this quadrant right here, you can see we still have to do some cleanup. This is fever few from last year. Uh, we've got our row of strawberries, which technically perennial. So I'll probably leave them out here. And then I do have a little patch of delphiniums coming up, which I'm gonna be adding more to that patch. I'm really happy with that though, that's awesome. And then we do have our wheat. So this is a project that, you know, once we harvest the wheat, I will be planting perennials in their place. Looking really great though, look at that. So lush, so many weeds. Oh, we've got some carrots right here. And here's a look at it back toward the house. Isn't it just gonna be so much fun? Oh, it just, I don't know, kind of reinvigorated me for this space and it just makes me so excited. Uh, Paul and Bethany brought over some bulk compost for this section right here, got this all done. I don't know if I'm gonna leave the obelisks there or if we're gonna plant a little just small ornamental tree. There will be a bench here or maybe we'll plant this up and put the bench right in the grass. I kind of want to do that. I know that would be a total pain for mowing, but I would really like the bench to be in grass. I think that'd be pretty. We'll see. Okay, so now I want to head somewhere where I can just set the camera down and I will run through the list of roses that we did plant. They all pretty much look the same at the moment. So uh, we'll throw some pictures up on the screen of their blooms. All right, guys, we're here in the Hartley to go through my list, which I did make a spreadsheet because I wanted to keep track of um, color categories, what varieties I had coming, uh, and then numbers and all of that. And that way I can make notes as well. If we decide to pull one, I can make notes about why I didn't like whichever one I pulled so that I don't accidentally pick that one up later on. I don't know, best intentions, we'll see if it works. But I do have them broken up into categories and I'm not gonna give a ton of detail. I'll just run through each uh, color category. I'll give you the size that the plant grows and the color that it is. So. Let's start with the pink category since that was the first row we planted. So the first one is Distant Drums, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with that one. It's kind of this smoky pink and there's some like uh, lavender and apricot notes in that flower. It's so, so pretty, grows four by three, kind of the perfect size. There's Eglantine. I don't know if I'm saying that one right. It's a David Austin, absolutely beautiful, soft pink, full cupped, nice fragrance. And that one I think grows four by four. Next one, is it Grand Dame? Is that how you say it or is it Grand Dame? I don't know. I've heard it pronounced both ways, but deep pink, big flower, beautiful, beautiful color. Uh, and this one gets a little bit bigger, five to six feet tall and four to five feet wide. And a lot of those larger shrub roses, you can prune them down a little bit to kind of keep them in size check. And there was one other one, James Galway in this section that wants to be a super big, like almost on the verge of being a small climber, but you can keep it pruned down. And that one's a pale pink color, also a David Austin, I think, and it's nearly thornless. And I do want to say that that one, if you let it go, would get like nine feet. So that's technically a climber. So I put that one at the very end of a row, kind of by the obelisk, so that hopefully if it does get bigger, I can either, I can decide if I want to move it somewhere where it has somewhere to climb, uh, or I can just kind of let it flop over into that flower bed planting 
area. Then we have Heavenly Scent, which I think is a hybrid tea. I don't normally go toward hybrid tea shaped roses. I usually like, like cabbage roses, David Austin, English rose style, and open face roses, like singles. I really like those where you can see all the yellow stamens. I think those are really sweet. Um, but Heavenly Scent is just a really pretty pale pink. And I want to say that one gets five by four. Then there's Lorraine. I think it's R-E-I-N-E. -E. This one grows about four by three and it's kind of, it's kind of a two-tone pink. Like the tops of the petals are a little bit darker pink while the outside of the petals that you're kind of seeing from the side are a little bit lighter and they're just big globe shaped blooms are really gorgeous. And then there's Louise Odier, uh, another David Austin, very full, kind of a medium to deeper pink. Uh, and right around like the four to five foot by four to five foot range. Then Princess Charlene de Monaco. Oh my gosh, this one is so pretty. So it's the full English rose and it's a very pale pink slash into the apricot kind of family. Uh, five by three is how big that one grows, but the smell of it's kind of that old rose really really wonderful. And then Sweet Mademoiselle, which looks a little bit like Boscobel to me. They're a really vibrant like pink orange kind of color. More, definitely more on the pink side than orange, but they've got kind of like that tropical edge to them. That one grows five by three. And then the last pink is the Whistly, right? Is that how you say it? David Austin, super beautiful, pale pink, uh, full, full uh, English rose style, lots of petals. And it grows about four and a half to four and a half feet tall and wide. Now that is it. So did I get them all? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Did I put in ten? Yes, I did. So ten pinks went in. We have room for seven more. Uh, and I have five more coming. So we'll go over those when I plant those later on. So we will have two empty spots that we can fill up with later on. And then if I do find a pink that kind of skews, or even, it doesn't really matter. If I find a pink that I like, I can pop it anywhere that there's a, an empty spot. I thought in the beginning, it would be nice to kind of try to keep them organized, but we'll see how that holds up. So the next two rows were the orange family and we had only four. So the first one is the uh, Abbe de Cluny. Apricot colored four by four, really wonderful scent. And it's more like a light apricot. And then another apricot rose, it's a light apricot called Apricots and Cream. And that one is a hybrid tea. So it's got that classic rose shape. That one grows five by three. And then there's Louise Clements, which was bred from Graham Thomas, I believe, uh, which is an English rose, a David Austin that's in the yellow family. So this one has a very unique kind of deep copper orange color, really beautiful, four by four. And the last orange one we planted uh, in the orange family is winter sunset which looks a little bit like apricots and cream except for the the orange is a little bit deeper um, and it grows about four to five feet tall four feet wide so we do have one two three four five more in the orange apricot family on their way and then we did receive two different varieties though from heirloom roses that i uh, have here but i'm not going to be planting them in the cut rose garden because they're climbers so we have two called the impressionist they're so gorgeous. And they grow 10 to 11 feet tall, seven to eight feet uh, wide. So I'm gonna be finding a spot for those. I just couldn't pass them up, even though I knew that they were not gonna end up in the rose garden, they will end up somewhere. And then I also have a polka, which is a nine to 10 foot climber, and it's a beautiful color, super popular rose. It's one we have usually have down at the garden center every single year. Next rose were the yellow, so we planted nine. I will gonna run through those really fast. Charles Darwin being the first, that's a David Austin, beautiful creamy yellow, grows four by four. And then Edith's Darling, which is a really interesting color. It almost has like that Dijon, like the honey Dijon kind of look. It's the yellow with the apricot with the kind of creamy white. So, so pretty. And that one stays a little bit smaller, three by three. So I tried to, to find roses that kind of ranged from that three by three to like five by five being max size. Fudged a little bit on some of them. And then there's Fun in the Sun, which grows about four and a half feet tall, three feet wide. And I think I could have planted this either in the yellow section or the apricot section. And that's kind of why I say like, these are the orange rose, but they may skew pink, they may skew yellow. And I feel like, uh, yeah, a lot of the roses do that. And that's what makes them so unique looking. I love roses that have more than one color in them, but this one definitely has a golden center apricot on the outside. And it's a grandiflora, which um, typically means that you'll have multiple blooms per stem. They're usually like a, a nice, presence like maybe like medium to large size roses in the landscape with clusters of roses so there's usually like three to four on this um, type of uh, rose here and this one has a very fruity scent which i think will be really fun then golden celebration which has that english style 
bloom, really deep, vibrant yellow. It's so pretty, four to five feet tall, four feet wide. And then Life of the Party, which has got a really interesting look. So the, the main part of the rose is kind of a yellow, light yellow to almost creamy white. And then the edges are kind of an apricot pink color, but it looks almost like dipped in a way. It's not like, um, I don't, they don't, they don't, aren't blended together colors. It's a really interesting look, I love it. And then Molineux. M-O-L-I-N-E-U-X. I probably butcher these names, but this one is a very pure golden yellow, very beautiful, really fragrant, and it's a little bit more compact in the yellow department when it comes to David Austin roses, growing four feet by four feet. I'm really excited about this one. I really like the color and the shape of the blooms. And then Morning Has Broken. This is the sweetest yellow rose. So it's kind of like a single, uh, but it's a little bit fluffier, like there might be a few little layers of petals but it's a little bit more open and you can see the center of the rose a little bit better so it has a little bit more of a like a natural kind of more wild appearance but the plant itself like four to five feet tall by four feet wide and I, this one's going to be really fun it's kind of like a filler rose almost it doesn't strike me as one that's going to steal focus but it'll be a really fun one to accent with. And then there's one called My Best Friend, which was actually an introduction from South Africa. And it, it's really interesting uh, description on this one. So it's like a soft, creamy yellow, really beautiful flowers. And it looks like, based on the pictures, I haven't grown this variety, that it does produce a lot of them. But they say like any true friendship, like any best friend, it takes time to you know create that relationship and be patient with this one like this variety likes to uh, form a really deep root system and beautiful glossy green leaves before it starts to bloom. So I love that that was included in the description because then I'll know that if it doesn't do a whole lot for me this year, maybe not even a whole lot next year, that that third year, it's usually the third year plants really start coming into their own. Um, so we'll give this one some time to see how, see how she does. And the last one in the yellow category is Tchaikovsky which has a very interesting look and depending on the picture that you see they look like a very delicate creamy white and a creamy yellow with maybe a hint of a blush and then in other pictures you see it or in different lighting it has a little bit more of a pink vibe to it uh, but this one just looks very very delicate and beautiful it grows about three to four feet tall and three feet wide and just produces really uh, large kind of old-fashioned looking flowers i only have two more coming in the yellow department so we'll have a few more spaces to fill in yet on that one the next row will be the white roses which we had four right did we have four maybe just the three so we have Bolero, white grows four by three. We have Royal Swan that grows four by four and Windermere. Mm. I love this one. It's a David Austin and it's kind of a, a creamy, very creamy white, and very, oh, I don't like antique looking. And that one grows four by three. And I am expecting five more in the white kind of category to come. And then in the purple category, it's it's interesting because a lot of those like smoky pinks, they term purple. Like there's one called Coco Loco, which they describe as a milk chocolate to lavender, uh, which I feel like that almost belongs almost in the cream to white category, not pink, not purple. It's just one of those weird ones. It's almost like you need a brown row. Does that make sense? Or like a tan row. You put all the smoky colored ones in that in that category. Uh, but Coco Loco is a beautiful one. I know I did plant one of those. And then we have uh, Arbor Rose Quicksilver, which is a lavender color. And that one wants to get a little bit taller, like seven feet. So we'll keep that one pruned down as best we can. See how it goes. Then we have um, Ebb Tide, which is a beautiful purple. It looks like a little bit more of an open face rose and it's a three by three grower. And then Twilight Zone, which is probably the deepest colored one of all four. Uh, and that one, like deep mauve to purple. And that one will grow three to four feet tall by three feet wide. And I think, let's see, I've got two more coming in that category. Which other one? Oh, Midnight Blue. We did plant that one. And that's purple, grows three by three. And then in the red category, which is our last one, I planted two. One is called Brick House, which is kind of a smoky red color, but very vibrant and a little bit more open, not as full cupped. And I think I will enjoy that structure. And that one grows about four by four. And then there's Hot Cocoa, which is also a very smoky red color. And I feel like using those smokier reds kind of blend into like you can almost take them a little bit more on that smoky pink side and use them with some um, just very autumn colored arrangements is where they usually end up for me. I do have two more red ones on their way, but there are two other roses that I received that I <laughs> I ordered them not realizing how massive they get. One of them is a red and it's called Dortmund. It gets 10 to 11 feet tall and 10 feet wide. I got it and I thought, oh, 
I don't, I don't think I could uh, justify putting that in one of the, the rose garden rows. So we will probably tuck that one somewhere else because I do really like the color. It'll be kind of like one of the great big wild rose looking things um, with single roses. And I think that I will love to use those in arrangements. And maybe we'll get some bigger long arching stems, which will be so fun to use. And then the second one is Darlow's Enigma, which grows equally as large, 10 to 11 feet tall, 10 to feet 10 feet wide and that is a single white so having those out in the landscape somewhere would be so wonderful because i i've got one table in particular in our house that i would love to create great big uh big arrangements with but i usually don't want to cut a whole lot i mean a big amount off of any one of our plants out here because you know a lot of these flower beds were just starting to establish and i don't want to take any size off of them so if we can get these roses up and going and we can use those for some great big structure in our arrangements, that'd be so much fun. And you guys, that is it for this video. What an amazingly fun project. I'm so excited to see it come together. I never thought I would say that about a rose garden, uh, but I think when you uh, figure out the right spot for something uh, where it's gonna make sense, where it's not gonna add a tremendous amount of pressure in terms of maintenance, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be good. And I will, when we get more roses, I don't think they're gonna send them all in one big uh, fell swoop. I think they're just gonna be sending them as they are ready to be shipped. Um, so we will probably just tuck those into video projects along the way as we get those, but we will share those with you when we, um, when we get them and when we start adding to that space. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.